trust. It seems to be a more valuable commodity than at any other time in our lives because actually there seems to be less of it in society than ever before. However, trust is about so much more than just believing something you hear. It's trusting yourself to quit. It's trusting yourself to take a leap of faith. It's trusting you can become comfortable with discomfort. Put simply, we believe that trust is central to achieving high performance. And today we welcome an author, an Oxford University lecturer, someone whose TED Talks have had millions of views. It's a pleasure to welcome someone who can really help us understand trust in the way we need to. She's also the host of Rethink Moments, the brand new podcast that will challenge you to think in a different way. Rachel Botsman, welcome to High Performance. Thank you for having me. It's nice to have you with us. So in the sphere that you exist in, what is high performance? So I was thinking about this on the way over, and I was thinking about contexts where I have to give a high performance. And I think that's really on stage, so I have to do a lot of public speaking. And it's interesting because for me, there are two really different types of high performance. They're really different. The first is not that interesting to me, but I think it's actually really important to being a professional at something. And it's when you've trained enough, when you've done it enough times, mentally and physically, that it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. So with a talk, I could be really jet lagged. I may not have slept because my kids have kept me up. The room is all dark. The audience are drunk. I've had that one before. They're all men. The AV doesn't work. You lose your sound. It doesn't matter. But as soon as my feet hit that stage, I'm okay. Like, I'm on solid ground because I'm very confident in what I can do. And I think that's where people are paying for your consistency and being able to deliver regardless of what's going on in your life. You can, you can sort of like just block that out and perform. And I think that's really important. But what bothers me is I think about so much training and education and it sort of leans towards that type of performance but the one that I am really curious about because it doesn't happen that often is in this it's sort of like a liminal space between like the known and the unknown where you discover something about yourself it's very expansive and you know when it's happening and the audience know when it's happening. And it's like that magic moment of discovery. And I think it doesn't matter whether you're watching a musician or a sportsman or someone giving a talk, you know when those moments are happening, but they are very, very rare. And that's the type of performance that I'm motivated by, why I keep going. But it's the other type of performance that I think is really about being a professional and the consistency, but you have to be curious to discover this other type of performance to really expand yourself and the work. So, I mean, that, I mean, there's so many questions that that opens up. Yeah, I've, I've read in the past, Rachel, you describe um, trust as having a confident relationship with the unknown, mm. which is what you're describing there. Would you explain a little bit more about what that looks like when you've experienced it? Yeah, it's a good question. So, the way I define trust is actually quite different to many people. So a confident relationship with the unknown. So a lot of people will talk about trust in terms of having full confidence or knowing the outcome or knowing what to expect. Well, actually, you don't need a lot of trust in those situations. It's when there's high uncertainty or there's a high unknown. So to discover that, so that side of yourself, you actually need really, really deep trust. And if I think about it in the context of public speaking, it's often when you just let go. And it may be that you've, you know, really worked on that speech or you've really thought about something that you let yourself go in a different direction and you discover, wow, I never know, knew I could connect with the audience that way or even like my body could move that way on stage. Um, and so I think that's where the trust comes from. Like if you're always staying in the, in the known, right? If you're always on script, if you always stand in the same way, if you've always reading, you know, I see speakers and I'm like, oh my God, you've done that same speech a hundred times. And not that there's anything wrong with that. That doesn't require a lot of trust in yourself. The trust is I'm going to go on stage and I roughly know where I'm going to go and I know my topic. So 
I'm going to use this space as an opportunity to discover something about this topic and about this audience and about myself that no one can plan for. Which reminds me, as you're saying it, I've read a, a, a few athletes that talk about this. I, the one that comes to mind is uh, the female golfer, uh, Anika Sorensen, that divides, um, when she goes to play a game, uh, that she has a line where she says, this is the almost uh, the stage where I process all the information, but then I have the play zone where I just go into the unknown and just do whatever comes at me. Mm-hmm. How do you create the environment for you to do the preparation and develop that trust in, say, your subject matter? What's the moment that you decide you're just going to let go and go to the edge and see what comes after that? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I'd love to say that it was as conscious as saying, today is the day that I'm going to do something unknown up there. But it's not like that. I mean, the practice definitely is important. Like, you know that you are on such solid ground with this material. You know it, like, it's it's in you. It's inside and out. And in some way, you know how the audience is going to respond to 80% of it. So it's like comedians, right? They, they, they talk about it as fishing. Right? I'm just going to go into a totally new place. But I think so many factors have to be right for those moments to happen, which is why I think when you're watching a musician or you're watching someone play and you know they've entered that, and it is a state, it is a place, it is, it's so magical to watch because it is a very different type of performance that is still high, but it's not the masterpiece it's not the magical moment so and I think like I've given hundreds probably not thousands of talks I could probably give you five where I've ever reached that performance level and I can remember the feeling I can't remember any of the others but I remember the feeling of those talks um, but, go on. no go on I was gonna so if we so have you explored those five occasions and gone back to work out what what was it that happened there that didn't happen on the 999 other occasions. <laughs> yeah, because maybe I could come up with a formula. <laughs> no, um, I'm always decoding things. So, yeah, honestly, yes. And things I've observed are usually I've given a couple of really crappy talks beforehand. So I've had like a kick where I've been like, you know what, you've been like in second gear and you're getting a bit lazy. So there is that sort of plateau that then you have to make a decision, am I happy here or am I only gonna kick myself? So I think that is one. Um, The second is there's usually a tension or energy in the air. So um, one I had to give uh, right before Sheryl Sandberg was gonna come out and publicly do her first apology for Facebook. And I walked into that room and like, you you couldn't even squeeze in because there were media, like they weren't there for me, they were there for her. And I was like the warm up act. And there was a part of me that was like, right, I'm gonna show you, right? Cause I didn't even have a seat. They hadn't even, it was all full of the Facebook team. So I think there is that energy and tension that is in the audience, but also in yourself that allows you to kick in and not, it's not about proving something to yourself, but you just go into a different place. So I think that that is definitely one. And then I think the third is probably everything sort of peaks, right? So I'm not talking about physical performance for me, but like the material is just in a really interesting place and it's connecting to something in the world and that the design of the slides and the stories that you're telling, like you're just hitting all these beats. And then the final thing, and I wish I knew, I wish I knew how this happens is that there are no socks in my head. So, I mean, I call like the, pu- you know, like the voices, I think of them as these little puppet socks. I, I used, you know, like, yeah. you, so often they're just chattering, you know, do the audience like me? Oh, I've got an hour, am I gonna get it done? Or I'm gonna run, like, there's so much noise. And in those moments, like, everything is quiet. Like, there are no socks. And you never know, like, you can't control that. If I knew that, then, yeah. It's, it's it's yeah it's pretty special when it happens but it's really hard work to get there so what what can we do as people listening to this podcast who they're not doing what you do they're not authors they don't stand up on stage but they would love to be 
in this state really of trusting themselves because when I think about the story you just told I think a lot of people listening to this would go oh I've had a couple of bad performances so I'm just going to pull back a bit mm. oh I've just looked in the room and it's really full so I need to really control what I'm saying today and try and deliver what I know I've delivered before successfully oh wow Cheryl's also on stage so I know I'm going to get directly compared to her so that's another little sort of tickle of self-doubt that I've got I find it very interesting that when all of those are things that could derail a performance you found that they actually lifted the performance how how do our listeners get themselves into a headspace where they can trust themselves in what feels like the sort of the big moments really because actually it translates to sport it translates to business it translates to dealing with the children or having a, a crisis in your family you know, this is transferable stuff that i think is very valuable yeah i think the first thing is like i think doubt is one of the most misunderstood words like we see doubt as something very negative and I can't tell you the number of times I have to follow like some guru who is like never doubt yourself and I then come on stage and actually say no 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 trust is full of doubt like deep doubts explain why trust is full of doubt because doubt is a place of longing of it pulls you forward in some way. I mean, I know there's some doubt that is completely paralyzing, don't get me wrong, but there is a, a type of doubt that is actually in a place of, that you deeply care about something, which is why you're doubting yourself. Like if none of those thoughts come up, you're just sort of in a place of arrogance and not really thinking about it. So if you're thinking, sitting there going, God, I really, oh my God, how am I gonna do it? I really doubt, like, first thing is say like, I really care. And what is it that I'm doubting about myself in this situation and just keep, going in that quest like I'll sit backstage sometimes and I don't often get nervous it's like my weird place of calm on the stage but if I'm like oh god like oh god I can't follow that or that speaker was really great or I don't feel that well today whatever it might be I just keep digging like what is the real doubt and I think the second thing I've realized is that in those moments I let go of the need to be liked like likability is just the worst force against you in those situations. So what I mean by that is, of course, everyone needs to be liked. But if I go on that stage and I am going for that likability, that's what I'm gunning for. It's a very different performance than if I go on stage and I go, I'm just here to give. I'm just here to give the audience a different way of thinking about usually trust. And I don't care if someone goes, I really don't like her. Or I don't like the way she's dressed, or I don't like the way she speaks, or whatever it might be. But I say to them, did I give you something? And they say, yes. That, that's, that's all I care about, is that I'm there to give people something. So I think in those moments where the, the pressure is, is sort of overwhelming and flooding you, moving your space from, I need to be liked in this situation, to actually, I'm just here to give, I found really, really helps. It really shifts where you're at but it's that first answer that uh, you, like your explanation about doubt it sounded very much like you were um promoting the virtue of humility yeah there, where you're saying that if i doubt something as well as the care you're also saying i don't necessarily know all the answers would you explain how important humility is because a lot of people talk about being humble often when they're maybe standing in front of a big posh house or <laughs> a brand new car telling you how down to earth they are. Yeah. I think it's important for people listening to this to understand what humility actually is as a, both a mindset and a resultant behaviour. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I thought my next book was going to be on humility. I've realised it's not, but it's because in many ways it's a sibling to trust. So the way I define humility is with a confident relationship with what we don't know. And I think it's one of the most underrated skills in leadership, uh, sports, business, arts, whatever it may be. And that what we're starting to see is actually the rise of, I think Gareth Southgate is a beautiful example of this, um, of leaders that really exhibit humility. So they're not tied to fixed outcomes. They don't make false promises. They admit when they don't know how things are gonna turn out. Um, they don't pretend to give an answer in the void of information. And a reason why I think it's 
the moment for humility is that we've experienced political leaders who are the very opposite of that, right? You so, use the word leaders loosely, right, in that sentence. I, I used it very loosely in that sentence, but it's so deeply upsetting to me when people stand up there and they think their confidence comes from pretending to give the public an answer where there is no answer, right? Like every politician's answer should have been somehow, we don't have the information, we don't know how this is gonna. So I think this is a moment of recognizing this relationship between confidence and humility and they can go hand in hand. Society though is so, I think so responsible for this sort of stuff. Like let's talk about politicians for a second. I can no longer watch breakfast television. No. Because I turn it on thinking, right, how am I going to be educated by something that the foreign secretary or the health secretary is going to tell me? And then I realise actually all I'm watching is a game of cat and mouse where the interviewer is trying to catch out the interviewee with no thought of, right, what's the best thing for, for this audience? How can I really educate the people at home today about the challenges of this person's job? And then because... The politician is thinking, hold on, all they're trying to do is set me up for a fall. So they'll ask me four or five teaser questions and then bang, they'll ask me something that makes me look daft. I'll give them nothing. So then I end up watching three minutes or four minutes of nothing, posturing, trying to look like the clever person. And I have never heard a politician say, I don't know. And if I heard a politician say, I don't know, I would finally think, joy, I'm getting the truth from this person. And I think we all... Like, I know we can criticise them for not coming on and just going, right, here's the truth, okay, I haven't had that meeting yet. I don't know the answer to that question. We had a conversation and none of us knew the, the correct decision to take. They can't do that because society then kills them mm. for not having the answer. The headline in the newspaper is, we don't know, we're confused, we're lost, we're rudderless. But we're all confused and lost and rudderless at times. So... I don't know how we start the conversation in a different way in society to allow people in positions of power to say, I don't know. I totally, I mean, I think media and the journalists are the other half of this equation, right? So you can, I can hear it in my head if a politician were, oh, well, I don't know. You, you don't know. I pay you to know. Yeah. Like, blah, 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 blah. So it's, whereas I think there are examples of leadership. So if you look at Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, and you look at even Angela Merkel, right? I don't know, I'm in the dark as much as you, but I'm going to do everything in my power to get the science and get the information to give you an answer. That feels like a very different, I don't know because I haven't done my homework or I don't know because I don't have the right people around you. But I, th I think what the public are completely fed up by is just being treated like idiots, right? There is, there is zero trust in the media right now. Um, and there's zero trust in the context of those interviews because people are not curious to explore the unknown, right? It's like talking about things that are right in front of them and the facts, and I think everyone's just really tired of that conversation. So what's the consequences when trust does start to get eroded then? <laughs> well, um, it's a vacuum. So it's not like... You, you cannot live without trust, right? You, you can't walk out your front door. So I actually, you know how often when we talk about trust in a state of decline, we're shown some chart that's like a graph where trust is just uh, going down. It's not actually the right way of visualizing it because what actually happens is trust is more like energy. So it, it changes form and it moves to another person or another system or another structure, right? So. You saw this in the US uh, when this big trust vacuum opened up, partly a uh, uh, response to the financial crisis, but many other factors. A voice like Trump rises up, and like it or not, many people trust him. And he understands the power of the emotional truth versus the factual, factual truth. And what happens is we start to have no shared sense of reality or factual reality, I should say. So it's a very, very precarious situation when we don't know whom to trust because we are so, trust is very easily manipulated. Um, one of my favorite thinkers is actually a woman called Maria Konnikova because, oh, yeah. she, do you know her? Yeah, because yeah, really. she studies con artists. Yeah. 
And in many ways, she understands trust better than me because she understands the psychology of manipulation. So if you want to understand trust, you actually should study con artists, um, which is a pessimistic way of putting it, but they know what information to present, how to present the information. And when you are, as a society, very fractured, you become more vulnerable to those con artists in all different shapes and forms. And if I remember rightly, like Maria wrote the book on the Sherlock Holmes brain, didn't she, where she spoke about the different ways of thinking. But I think it's Maria, if I'm, I don't know, correct me on this, Rachel, because I'm right wrong, didn't she? Because I remember reading about Donald Trump in saying, what does he do well? And the three things that he did well were what Maria spoke about, the con artist, that he speaks in a language that's accessible, build a wall, drain a swamp, that everyone feels they're in on the conversation. Mm. The second one was that he removes uncertainty. I will take the action that nobody else will do. I'll, I'll be the strong man. And then the third one was it was always punitive, wasn't it, that he was meeting out justice. Mm. So it was like, you know, we'll... Uh, will unleash shock and awe on you if you hit us we'll hit you back twice as hard are they the kind of factors that you describe in there that, that that con artists use yeah and i think like a con artist doesn't have to look like bernie madoff right there are much softer <laughs> forms of that right and the last one that you describe is really important because in times of sort of high uncertainty or, or fractured trust leaders that often do well are not leaders who stand for something, they're leaders who push against something. It's, it's a really different thing. It's like, you know, I stand for this purpose. It doesn't actually cut through. It's when I stand against something, this is what I'm gonna push against. Like that taps into something quite visceral that people are looking for. They find a security in that. So I think that's interesting in it. When we look back over the last 20 years, how many leaders will we look at around the world that really stood for something? I think there'll be leaders that stood against something i find all, i find it quite depressing in some ways because i want there to be nuance and i want there to be real sort of honesty that we can break down and question and challenge and discuss so are these people that we're talking about here are they playing into the way that a human brain is built or are they playing into the way that human beings have been controlled and manipulated and changed in the modern world that we live in yeah it's so interesting you say that because in the last two weeks I've been sent three books on attention and nuance that we're losing the ability for nuance and we're losing the ability to focus deep attention and um, I can't remember the names of all the books one is um, brilliant it's called by Johan Hari um, Stolen Focus um, and he is arguing that at the root cause of so many problems in the world is this idea of fractured focus that we have lost the ability for nuance and debate and like fascinating research he's done like observing conversations all around the world so how long we can actually sustain the same thought or thread um whether it's in a professional setting or in a personal setting so when i think about things that i worry about things that are leading to this it is our ability to really be able to challenge our own beliefs which is where the humility part comes in, and to think in nuance. Um, and Can we get it back? Yeah. Wow. So I think, look, I think some of it requires very deep systems change in education and business, but I've seen it personally in myself. I think it's something that you can recognise and you can train yourself back into nuance. So one of the things that I try to do, this might sound a bit geeky, is like, okay, I've got to become a beginner at something, a total beginner. And so um, I've tried <laughs> learning Latin, with because I never learned Latin at school. Um, I tried learning the piano. I've tried um, applying to do something in a completely different field and just going through the interview process and feeling like a beginner and a student again. And all of those things, they, it like opens up this door where you're like, oh, I didn't know I was curious about that. Or because this is, I think, the danger of actually performing at a high level is that things can become like too solid, like too 
do, does that make sense? Like become too black and white. And so you have to go, this is really nice and really comfortable, but actually my attention for this is really short now. And my ability to challenge my own thinking about this topic is shrinking, not expanding, which happens when you become an expert in anything. So what do I know nothing about? Nothing about? And how can I immerse myself in that? And then you just start to discover nuance again. So can you give us an example, Rach, from one of those activities that you did? Because there'll be people listening to this that might be thinking of taking up a new hobby or a new pursuit. What did you learn from one of the examples where you started with the beginner's mindset? So I hate being a beginner. Um, like, do you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to learn the scales. I want to like get to Beethoven and Mozart. Yeah. Like, I'm not good at going back to the beginning. Um, I think that was one. The uh, one was really interesting. So I did um, uh, model building. Um, like, you're like, why on earth would you model building? Because uh, I had this feeling that I think really two dimensionally, and I can't think in three D. Um, so I get. I got lost going to the bathroom, right? I have no sense of direction. Like I don't have a three-dimensional mind. So that's just something that you'd never discover unless you learnt how to physically build a three-dimensional model. It's those kinds of things where you're like, I don't think in that way. But how do, but how do you identify what you want to... So are you identifying a gap you want to plug? Or no, a strength no, no. You want to, a strength you want to thrive in? No, I don't go in going, oh, I'm going to learn Latin because of I just go right I'm just I'm just going to learn Latin and then I go my god my recall is terrible now like so my son can learn in five minutes what take me an hour like why is that going on or with the piano like why am I so frustrated there's no enjoyment in the the learn so I think if you go in with like a preconceived it kind of takes the beginner's mindset away it, it, it plays the power of rethinking which I, you've created in your podcast series about can mm. you explain why rethinking is the most important thinking that we can be doing yeah like this emerged i don't know if things do emerge organically but i just got this feeling so i started writing this newsletter called rethink very early on in the pandemic and it was because i felt like everyone was telling me what to think like everything was what to think what to think i didn't know what to think or i couldn't really sustained focus for 10 minutes well, the world's now created to do that so isn't it you know we look at something on social media we'll then just get peppered with the things that play to what we already think because that's yeah. how those platforms are designed which i hadn't really considered it but you know that stops you rethinking doesn't it because it just gives you that one perspective it's it's everything's designed to reinforce your belief and i became acutely aware of this because um i didn't really enjoy homeschooling um my <laughs> my kids said well, don't know how you teach anyone because you know I was not good at teaching them um and I thought you know I just started to look everywhere anywhere for information that would tell me my kids were going back to school now this was like on April 2nd right they weren't going back for a really long time but I'd like run downstairs and say to my husband, I think it's going to happen next week and he's like where did you find that and it'd be like some stupid blog right they're not going back so I started this idea of well who teaches me how to think like, so who's actually challenging me to look at a piece of information or the way I see the world or a belief and how could I think about that differently? And I couldn't find anything. So it really started off as just a newsletter which found an audience. And then I thought this would be really interesting to hear people's stories to rethink big moments in their lives. So if you could take them back, and these are people you know who've achieved amazing things or created something amazing, could you get them to rethink that? And to be honest, with some guests it works, and other people, I cannot even get them into that space of rethinking. So, what which is that? Is I don't know if it's like they. I mean, in many ways, they did create a masterpiece, or they did have this iconic moment, and it's so complete the story that they have told around that that to challenge that is actually to challenge their identity. So you can't even get a chink in, right? You try and then you like go left and you go right and then you turn it upside down with them and they just, it's its too complete to like pull it apart or even pull a thread away from them is, is really to challenge their identity. So it's quite quite hard. I'm a, I'm a big fan of rethinking, but only really from my work on this podcast. And the thing that thrills Damon and I so much is when people say, wasn't expecting to enjoy that episode or 
I knew nothing about that person or this isn't the kind of thing I would normally listen to. Um, what do we need to be doing on high performance with the questions we ask and the guests that we invite on to try and get people to rethink? What do you think the role should be that we should be playing for people that can give them the most value? God, that's such a good question. I think you can take them back more to moments in time. So I think sometimes you, it's not a criticism, it's, it's an observation that you talk about the dressing room or you talk about the pitch, but they are generalized settings over a period of time where sometimes if you take people back to a moment, I think you did it with Johnny Wilkinson actually with the drop goal. And it's like the feeling, even the smell, what you're seeing, that I think is really interesting because even the moment they pick is probably not the penalty or the moment they won is very revealing about people. So I'm really interested in that. It's like, where do people go to? Do they go early on in their career? Is it something recent? Is it when they were a child? Like those very defining moments that you don't quite know why you've picked that, that there's something interesting in the selection of the story that they've chosen to tell you. Like why, why are you telling me that? Because people do share with you like unusual stories that they haven't. Why are they sharing that story with you right now? What would you pick? Yeah. Me? Yeah. yeah, I shouldn't have said that, should I? <laughs> yeah, but you should have. Because um, this, is, uh, this is what it is, isn't it? God. Um, so my mind naturally goes qu quite young. So like f six or seven or it jumps forward to 18 at university. I'm not sure why it jumps forward to this moment, but it jumps forward to, so I was meant to read law at university and I was under a lot of pressure to do one of these, like, you know, sort of professional degrees. As, and um, I decided that I was gonna read fine art. Um, and so my parents were very supportive, but I remember uh, we all were given these studios and I had this amazing tutor. It was a guy called Jordan Baseman. And up to that point, the way I had done well was to be incredibly organized and incredibly disciplined. So I would make these wall, <laughs> these wall charts that were color coded. I mean, it's, it's so embarrassing why like green and blue and like, read for free time like I like structured my time this time I got through A levels have through, got through GCSEs and I made when I got to university I was like oh my god there's no timetable because no one gives you a timetable right it was so frightening so I remember I thought well I'll create my own timetable right reading art trips and my tutor walked in and I haven't I don't know why my mind's gone there he walked in and he started laughing at this wall chart and he said this is brilliant and I said, what, what do you mean? And he thought it was a piece of art. Like he thought like this, <laughs> this was like Brilliant. my artifact, my comment on society of needing control and order. And I said, no, no, that's, it's not a piece of art. It's my wall planner. It's how I'm, this, how I'm gonna organize things. And he said, oh man, you are gonna struggle so much on this degree. You need to take it down. And so I remember it's a bit like, one of my kids where they're trying to get rid of their the toy that they've slept with you know their whole life but they're not quite old enough so it's like in the drawer so I like took it down I folded it all up and I put it in the drawer and it lived there for a year now probably where my mind's gone there is because that was the moment that I could throw away order and I could immerse myself in work and that was the foundation of my career right was to pull threads from all different yeah. places and also trust yourself that you could do that Totally. I never ripped it up, though. <laughs> like, well, is there something there, though, Rachel, around, like, removing yourself from the echo chamber of just hearing your own opinions played back to you, that you, you put, you know, we spoke before about nuance and the art of nuance, of is hearing people that you wouldn't disagree with, being around people who you maybe don't feel you've got common ground with. Was that, are you identifying maybe one of the first times where you were surrounded you're surrounded with people that are challenging your perceptions. I think it was the first time I was around people that made me feel uncomfortable. Like, right. so, cause I was like, you know, I went to an all girls school. It was in the city of London. Like it was a pretty linear path. Yeah. And 
I, th you know, I could have kept not a straight line, but to go and read law at Oxford, it would have just been continuing that trajectory. So I think it was the first time I've been around people that had completely different journeys and reasons for being there. Even that this sounds so weird to say, like they had a very different rhythm to the day. So a lot of them would work really late through the night and I'd never experienced that. So it was like unsettling, but really, I mean, some of my best friends still are like from when we all studied fine art together. So, and it was their like, their bravery to create, I could like some of the stuff they made. Like I think about like my best friend who like, you know, just cut onions for her final degree show. And was, I know it sounds so weird, but she was in this massive ball gown and she was in tears. And now she is like a very famous costume designer. And like, it was all there. Like she was, I mean, she wasn't designing costumes, but she was designing things that made people feel something. And I thought to emotionally connect in that way, to be able to do that, that is, that's a gift. So how do we take that principle of being able to go out of our comfort zone, surround ourselves with conflicting views, conflicting um, perspectives? How do we take that and apply it within our everyday life how have you learned to do that so we avoid the echo chamber of just hearing our own our own views repeated back to us yeah I mean I think it's it's quite practical ways to do it like so um you know I read I read a lot just for the love of reading um and you know go when you go into a bookshop where do you usually turn right what's the table you usually go to like towards the cafe towards the cafe <laughs> do you are you not a reader? I am a reader, but I like to read with a cup of coffee. Yeah. You like to read a quick, yeah. So just go to a completely different place. So like, I never read memoirs, I had no idea, but now I like, love memoirs. So I think it's like sort of recognising patterns of thinking and just physically turning yourself in a different direction. And you can apply that in hundreds of ways. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I'm thinking, as you're saying it, like the benefits just for people listening to this is... Um, do you remember John Haidt's book on the coddling of the American mind yeah. where he spoke about this idea of the three big things that are causing such polarised views of the world and one of it is that we don't allow ourselves to be exposed to different ideas, different nuances. Yeah. What was that book? Was it America? I um, can't remember what it's called. It's an amazing book. His work's amazing, Jonathan's work. And then yes. he wrote another book on happiness, I think. The happiness hypothesis. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Yeah. He's a brilliant thinker. So that's the other thing I do is like... You know, I look for thinkers that join, not join dots actually, like they just, they pull on all these different threads and sometimes I really hate what they're saying and I don't always self-identify. I think we read, we read too many books where you're like, oh yeah, I self-identify with that character. Actually, it's the ones where you're like, oh, I hate this character or I really don't want to watch this program. That that discomfort is, is like a mental muscle that you're working. Well, we just ignore anyone we disagree with now. <laughs> We cut them out. So like, oh, do you? I, maybe I do. But I think as a society, we definitely do. If someone isn't on your wavelength or isn't your politics or isn't your beliefs, then I think we're very quick to say, I don't, I'm not listening to them, I don't like them. Because you don't want the challenge or you just tune out? I, um, I think I do chase those people because I yeah. spend my life saying on this podcast, please listen to people that you either don't know of don't or don't agree with or perhaps don't even understand just give them the opportunity but I think generally we're I think we've stopped chasing people that have a different viewpoint to us because we just want our own viewpoints to be reinforced and I think um what I was what I've sort of sense is really dangerous and I like the conversation there about cutting up the onions in the um in the ball gown because she then went on to be in a I think like with our kids and even with our friends particularly though with our children who you know, we all have a responsibility to kind of guide their thoughts in many ways, don't we? Like, how often do they do things that actually are like... So my daughter, she's seven, she's obsessed with Playmobil and will spend hours building a Playmobil house. And I think there's two ways of looking at that. She either likes Playmobil, simple, or she's massively creative and she's creating little family units and she's working out what does a family look like and how does that person interact with that person. And, and I think it's very easy to stop the creative mind from going anywhere interesting because it doesn't play into our own set of beliefs about what life should be. So, so easy to say to your friend, why are you being such an idiot? Why are you cutting up onions in a ball gown? If you don't allow that expression, you never get to the point where she's 
designing amazing clothes 20 years later. And I, I kind of feel sad that I think we're cutting off a lot of creativity at source mm. because it isn't improving your maths or improving your English or But you know with your, table. your daughter with the play... Mobile. Mm. Is she onto Lego yet, or is it the blocks? Just no, it's still not really a lot of Lego in our house. Playmobil obsessed, yeah. So I think the other thing we do we do to kids at a really young age, and I have to stop my kids at eight and ten, is you're too much, right? So with my friend, she won't. Her name's Holly. Like she used to wear a tiara to go to Tesco. She used to really dress up, you know. Like she was too much. But that's who she was, and that's why she is brilliant at what she does. With my son, like, he talks too much in class. He loses stuff too much. My daughter spends too much time by herself. Well, if I think about myself as a child, the report card always said she's in her head too much. Now, if my parents had said, right, get out of your head, and start like applying yourself to things like maths that are really important, that would have cut all that off. And I think that is, I've observed that a lot in parenting and schooling. I catch myself doing it. You're, Don't be too much of that, like just pull it back. But it's in that muchness that there is something, I think that is where the high performance Otherwise, comes from. Otherwise, what are you? You're just dull across all of the parameters that we view life, like why not? why not be too much in one area? And then as you get too much, you attract other people that are too much in that area and you live a life of too much in an area that you're massively passionate about. Yeah. Rather than just where, you know, you, you dull your identity, walk like them, talk like them, act like them, and then what's left? As long as you're not too arrogant, there are much as that too... Oh, I don't know, actually. Is like, that can a you, bad thing, though? Maybe not. Maybe if you find a way to channel that, maybe that's my own that judgment there, yeah. Saying, right. Don't, well, don't be what you are, but, yeah. you know, what harm will it do if one, you know, unless they end up running a country or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so interesting that even someone like you, so well read, thinks so carefully, immediately goes to that, totally. that place now yeah. to pull themselves back, you know? Yeah. I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Can I ask you about an idea that I'll admit I've, 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 I've taken it from your earlier books Rachel and stolen with glee I see yeah yes. no no I, I admit that I have stolen yeah. it with glee because I talk about it sometimes to uh, to leaders yeah. about what you describe as the three D's that when trust oh, yeah. disappears so we start with people become defensive then they become disenchanted before finally or they, they disengage before they become disenchanted mm -hmm. would you tell us a little bit more about that because the reason I use it is sometimes I I, I ask myself when uh, I'm in a situation, where am I on that scale? Mm. And I think it's really important for people to understand it personally so they can understand the manifestation of trust and what that looks like. Yeah. I'm, at, I'm really proud. Like, that actually, that framework helps people a lot. So yeah. um, defensiveness, disengagement, and then disenchantment. Like, and it's a sign that trust is wobbling and then it's completely broken down. So... The defensiveness, and let's like let's apply this to different areas. This could be a, a personal relationship that you're in. Um, it could be a team setting where people are getting defensive. Um, trust isn't broken then, it's wobbling, wobbling. And people still care, they're still passionate, they're defensive because they want to be heard, right? They feel misunderstood. They don't quite understand what's expected of them. There's some kind of misalignment that's happening. And if you can get beyond that, trust can actually come out stronger the other side. So there's a key, and I'll, if I confess, the context I've used it is in sort of sports interesting mm. rooms to encourage leaders not to see people being defensive as something to be feared, see it as something to be addressed. It's the blaming. Like, that's yes. a really... Or um, the justification. So when you hear either blaming, it was because da 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 da, um, or so and so and so and, or this didn't happen, um, or the justification, I did this because of this. So people are either self protecting themselves or they want to be understood. So you really have to hear that story and hear that side. And um, and I think it's a place you can come back from. Yeah. Um, disengagement is the next stage on so if you think about that as a couple 
they've almost stopped arguing, right? They can't be bothered. They're not going to go to the therapist. And what's happening in that stage, and you see it in teams, right? They are literally going into two separate dressing rooms. They are fractured. They are divided. They are moving apart, away from each other. And then the last stage is disenchantment, where it's, they, they've gone, they don't even not care. All they have is a toxic relationship to the, where they've come from or what they were a part of. So the disengagement is sort of losing that fight, losing really caring about something. You don't, you don't even believe that if you told your side of the story or you tried to explain things that you would be heard or misunderstood. So you've, you, you, you're on that sort of uh, fork trajectory. And then by the time you get to disenchantment, it's a really hard place to come back from. So I think it's with teams, and I see this all the time with leaders, and you can see trust wobbling. Most teams trust wobbles, uh, you know, every few weeks actually. And right now in virtual environments, it will wobble even more. And you say, well, have the conversation. Have the conversation. I don't even know how to have the conversation. Like, how can you not know how to have a conversation where you've done something that has damaged or hurt that relationship? I did it, I did it the other week. And I realized I did something in a, public setting in a team setting that should have been a one-on-one -on -one. and as I did it I knew and I called this person up and I said all I have to say is I'm really sorry like I shouldn't have done that and I just want to hear your side of the story and I'm not going to say anything oh brilliant and he we moved on but if I hadn't have done that and I hadn't recognized that he probably would have woken up today and gone that bloody team meeting how she like humiliated me like so it just festers right so and people leave jobs because of a trust wobble because these these fractures are never addressed so I think it's one of the most I honestly believe it's one of the most helpful skills you can develop as a leader is to know how to go in in that defensive stage and to have the conversation so what top tips then beyond I mean that that great example of just mm. phoning up and saying I'm sorry is a really Full great stop. Way. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> no justification. Yeah. What yeah. other top tips could you give to leaders? Because I can see this is useful in families, whether in workplaces. Well, I'm sorry. Full stop is a big one right. because I'm sorry, but you've you've turned an apology into an excuse, um, and that that it sounds so simple, but we we all do it all the time, right? Yeah. So I'm sorry. Full stop is is a big one. Um, I think. Timing is really key. So when is that other person, not just you, because you often think, well, I have to calm down from this, or um, when is that other person in the right space to listen as well? And then giving them the heads up that you want the conversation. So just, you know, calling a team meeting or phoning that person up out of the blue kind of puts them on the spot again, right? You're repeating yeah. the behavior. So thinking really carefully about timing and setting and giving them sort of the heads up that you're going to have this conversation, I think is another really big one. And then um, I think it's tying it to something that, how can I explain this? Um, you're not trying to justify the way, the behavior, but you're trying to explain your intent you know what I mean? You're trying to explain where you were coming from. My intention for saying this was because of X, which is very different from, I said this because of X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. And you've done this in the past. My intention in this particular situation was this can be so helpful. It stops the kitchen sink thing happening as well. So my husband's probably laughing right now because like, <laughs> yeah. he's like, oh, I haven't heard you do one of these things in our marriage for a year. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I saw my love with Harry. And he, you know those things you say on your yeah. podcast? Oh, yeah. And you try yeah. bringing them into the home set. So what was your intention <laughs> yeah, there, exactly. Rachel? <laughs> um, before we move to our quick fire questions at the end, I, yeah. I'd just love to get your thoughts on the opposite side of that story, which is the person who feels like they've been wronged, the person who feels like they've lost the trust in the leader, the partner, mm. the friend. When someone has done something like that and we have lost trust what should we what should we be doing other than waiting for them to build the trust with us it's a really good question um i think it's first recognizing that 
you have permission to tell your side of the story, right? Like it's any great leader, it doesn't matter if we're talking about a teacher, a coach, whoever that may be, they will listen if you ask for permission to tell your story. So um, I think that's really important. The other thing is, is I personally think of trust as something we have to give. It's very powerful when you think it's yours, right? So you're making, this is why this language of building trust is very problematic because when I say, right, I want to build trust, it's assuming that I have control over this. But in any situation, you, the giver, has the trust. The leader doesn't have the trust. The leader has to earn that back. So realizing you're actually quite powerful in this situation, right? You have this trust to give back to them. And do they want to earn it? And I'm going to use this situation to really learn about that person and learn about this situation and learn about myself. And I'll still make a decision whether to give them their tr my trust back. You can still decide after the conversation, actually, you don't trust them. So I've always found it really powerful to think of trust as something that you give and then the other person has to earn. So any, any leader out there that's talking about, the, it's the number one question I'm asked, how do I build trust? They're not thinking about trust in the right way. It's great. It's like a powerful, a power over yeah. way of looking at trust. Which is what a lot of people use it for, don't they? They use trust as a power. Go on. So yeah. can I circle back to the first, the first part of this interview then when we spoke about you walking on that stage? Yeah. And um, you need the willingness to want to build that rapport and that trust with the audience that they're open to the ideas that you're going to share with them. How do you put yourself in that place to create an environment where trust can be shared and given? And Yeah, um, oh, that's a really good question. I think, I don't overthink it actually, which is really important. So I would say in the first few minutes of a talk, especially like, a big talk like you're at the Lincoln Center and there's thousands of people and like you are nervous to the core and you've got to get that audience in connect emotionally connected with you is actually recognizing those first three few minutes no one's listening like all it is about is human connection and what the audience want to feel is you're settled and you're calm up there and you're there for them so what I mean by that is when speakers come on the stage and they're like, so I've done this and I've done this, like they, they're basically giving their resume or I've just written this great book, you've lost the audience. But sometimes it's just a simple, like I often weirdly dress in a way that matches the backdrop. Like I would right. be dressed in exactly the same color, which it's happened so many times. Like it's almost, I should ask what color the backdrop is, but I'll be like, Oh my God, like I'm in camouflage, right? And recognizing that where the audience know that cannot be canned. There's a, like, everyone just sort of relaxes. So I think that's been the biggest, what I'm doing it for 12 years now, is like those first few minutes, you are just connecting with people. You're not actually, it's not when you give your best material. And then you kind of give them a sense of where they're going to go with you, but you don't map out the whole journey. So I also hate talks where they're like, we're going to cover five things in this order and then you're like oh we're only on point three as the audience yeah. so you it's like the start of a journey that's the way you think from the moment you hit the stage you're on that journey with the audience and you're moving with them and going into different directions and so I always say I'm going to give it up like the, I always say that's it I'm done and then like something happens on the stage and you're like actually it's a really interesting place to be love it Okay. Our quick five questions, Rachel, to finish with, if you wouldn't mind. The three non-negotiable behaviours that you and the people around you need to buy into. Ooh, um, number one, integrity. Um, number two, I don't know if it's a behaviour or an ability, but I'd use the word momentum. So um, people that can create momentum is really important to me and then the third is really hard um i would say probably 
warmth. Like I just, you have to radiate warmth around something. Um, it can be as you as a human, or it can be a passion or something. But if you've got no warmth, then yeah, I like that. I really, especially like momentum. Yeah, it's something that sometimes you just work with people and you think, can we just get this ball rolling, man? Yeah, yeah. It's a real art form to yeah. create momentum, especially when things have stagnated. Like people can come in and impose the will almost. Mm. Yeah, it's real. I think it's an underrated skill. What advice would you give to a teenage Rachel just starting her journey? Oh, um, a worry less. I'm such a worrier. Like, still working on that one. Yeah, definitely worry less. Even though you know Pippa Grange. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't. I think, um, like, if you, it goes hand in hand with like being an intense thinker and thinking about those things. But like, my mind will flip over the macro and the micro. Um, so, like, I why think, would you want less of that though? Because that may well be one of the reasons you're where you are today because I think the intensity sometimes is probably not healthy or enjoyable to be around so like finding things so for me it's the swimming pool and it's the garden like just finding places where you really can worry less and discovering those young I think is really helpful very good if you could go back to one moment in your life where would you choose to go and why I'd probably go back to being in the art room like I'd, I you know I love I love um, art rooms in schools. I love the chaos and I love the art teachers. Like, I love the smell of oil paint. I love just people in overalls and... Those messy sinks. Messy. I love that it's just really imperfect and people are making in there and there's like an energy that comes with maker spaces. So, yeah, if I had to pick a place I could live for the rest of my life, it would be in a smelly, dirty... (laughs) Art room. <laughs> if there was one book, TV series, or podcast that you'd recommend our listeners to engage with, what would that be? So it's just because I recently read it. There is a book called Wintering. Have you read it? Um, and I, I really didn't think I was going to like it. And I, it's all about our relationship with the cold. Um, and so she goes around the world exploring people's relationship with the cold. And it is the most beautiful book and the reason why I pick it is because it it happened because I went left and picked up a memoir and was not something I was interested in and literally I've given this as a gift to many people who also say why have you given me a book called wintering and then they it's like it's like a holding a warm cup of tea which is a funny thing to say about a book about the cold but it's it's very very comforting that book so yeah it's a great book to read very nice and finally your kind of last message really to the people that have sat and shared this conversation with us your your one golden rule for them to live a high performance life or your one final message for them i think it would be around when you reach a level of performance that does give you comfort whether that's financial comfort or just you know how things are going to turn out, find a way to go back into the curiosity of the unknown and respect yourself when you're doing it because that is the very essence of trust. And I think sometimes we don't recognise when we're actually giving ourselves permission to do that because we stay in that other mode of high performance that I spoke about at the beginning, in the consistency and the confidence and the capability side. So when you do go in that other expansive space, I say, like, really recognise it in yourself because it is the more interesting space where things happen. That was a cool conversation. I liked it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure.